morning and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, we appreciate your viewing, but also your participation. So um, throughout this video, we want you to comment um, questions and suggestions, et cetera, um, on the Facebook Live post. And we will try to get to some of those questions if we can't get to all of them. And we'll try to respond to the ones we miss after the fact. But I'm so excited. I'm Krista with the Chamber of Commerce. I'm really excited today to um, have two local experts in our community, Dr. Brown and Dr. Kennedy with Young County Family Clinic. And they are going to answer a few questions for us, walk us through some of the most recent updates and news related to this COVID virus. And so I'm going to kick it off by first just asking you, Dr. Brown, if you'll tell us a little bit about where we are as far as flattening the curve. That's kind of been the, I think the main objective that we've heard and what we've tried to do. So kind of as far as Young County goes, what are you seeing right now? Well, the curve is definitely flattened. Uh, uh, Governor Rabbit was on TV at, this morning on Fox News and he was saying that for the past 14 days, the curve has been fairly flat. We're seeing like 500 to 1,000 new cases a day. And that it peaked about 13 days ago when it was over 1,000. But since that time, there's been less than 1,000 cases a day. So I think it's definitely flattened. I'm sure that's a result of uh, the uh, early enactment of the you know, social isolation or, or uh, distancing. And uh, probably the weather may have something to do with it, too. Well, and I know we talked about this a little bit with Graham Medical Associates, um, Dr. Jones and Dr. Martin, but um, it, I think it is really neat that we can see results from some measures taken early on from our government officials and in large part, thanks to our, uh, the great advice we got from the medical community. But um, of course, you know, we don't want anybody to be sick ever. Um, and so anything that we have to do, those sacrifices we have to make, it's nice to be able to look backwards and say, okay, that was, you know, that worked essentially. What about um, when we do lift the shelter in place, Dr. Brown, do you think that there's a chance we'll see a spike in cases? I know I've heard some rumors, reports, gossip, whatever about that, but what is your opinion on that? I think there's a great fear that it could be a spike. I don't think we've seen the infection here like they have in New York and Louisiana uh, for whatever reason. I'm optimistic that the hot weather is going to be a big help. You know, we have the flu tends to be seasonal. And I think this, my opinion is that this will be hopefully a seasonal illness. And I think when the Texas hot weather hits, you know, pretty much kills everything. It's, Nothing will survive a Texas summer, so I'm optimistic that uh, that uh, we will. I'm hoping we will we will not see a spike once we start opening things up, just because I think the hot weather is going to be helpful. Excellent. Would you say that it's still important as we do open, you know, everything back up and get back out and start to gather once again? Would it be important to still maintain some of the practices that we've learned? throughout this um, shelter in place and social distancing? Certainly it would be wise to continue to do social distancing and you know, whether people continue to wear a face mask throughout the summer, uh, that remains to be seen. I don't know what the recommendations would be, but uh, uh, hopefully as time goes on and the case cases diminish, they'll be able to open up uh, venues where we can have you know, baseball games and kids can get back on the playing field and we can have more people gathering at the theaters and whatnot. That will be nice. And I'm assuming that um, you would probably recommend that everybody continue to wash their hands. Yes, obviously washing hands and covering your uh, coughs and sneezes up is important. And hand washing is easy and the more the, more the better. Absolutely. Um, Dr. Kennedy, I'm going to switch over to you now and thank you again for joining us. Um, what type of capabilities do uh, you all have or what have you guys changed as far as um, the way you're seeing patients, et cetera, at Young County Family Clinic? Yeah, we're um, fortunate in the fact that we have two separate buildings um, just connected by our walkway. So we've actually been able to separate into a sick clinic and a well clinic. 
Um, so our patients do have completely separate waiting rooms. We're seeing them in complete separate exam rooms, um, which I think provides some comfort and some protection for patients, knowing that if you're coming in for your regular checkup or a well visit, you're not sitting in the same area as somebody who's been coughing, sneezing, et cetera. So we're fortunate to be able to do that. Um, we do have capability to test at our clinic. We've done some of the nasal swabs is what we have available. Uh, we go through the hospital lab, so it does take 24 to 48 hours to have results back, but we are able to test if you meet criteria. Excellent. And do y'all, will y'all have that um, rapid test? Do you know what I'm talking about? The one that GMA has now? The antibody test, the blood test, we do not have that. Um, that I, I can't really answer if we would be getting that or not. Okay. There okay. is a rapid test that is a nasal swab that's out that I know the hospital has been trying to obtain, but the supplies are being sent to the hotspots in the country. So we're not sure. able to have that at this point, um, but there's a few of those out. And I assume we would be trying to obtain those for our clinic as well once we're able to get the supplies. Excellent. What about um, when people make an appointment, do you, you know, do you prefer people to call first, let them, let you, let your um, staff know if they're feeling, feeling ill, have a cough, those kind of things before they make an appointment? Yes, we are doing some triaging over the phone. So we have a questionnaire that we ask everybody that calls in. Um, if we have walk-in patients, we do the same questionnaire. That way we know which clinic is more appropriate for them, what kind of symptoms they're having, um, and kind of what the risk factors are before we even get in the room with them. So we do prefer that people call ahead, um, but we are still taking walk-ins. We're also asking that people not bring extra individuals to their appointments. If it's not somebody that really needs to be at the appointment, we ask that you stay home just to keep everybody more protected. Absolutely. Um, Dr. Brown, what about current treatment options? Well, I think that, that as you know, uh, the hydroxychloroquine, the Plaquenil has been out for a long time and that's been touted as a potential good medicine along with Zithromax. The, the Plaquenil or hydroxychloroquine has been out since 1955 and it's had a, a long track record. Side effects are, are pretty minimal. Uh, GI distress is sometimes a problem and there's some eye problems on the higher doses. But I would say that if I was to treat a patient out here, Plaquenil and, and Zithromax, there'd be no reason not to try that. They're pretty safe medicines. And maybe they'll help, maybe they won't. As far as uh, there's some antiviral drugs out that they're trying to use, but before I would use something like that, I'd probably consult with infectious disease. And the plasma donations, you know, they're using the plasma from survivors or the people who have recovered. And that would be something that would be more available in Metroplex as opposed to out here. So what medicines would be available here for treatment? You know, through our hospital or through the clinics. The Plaquenil and the uh, Zithromax is pretty readily available. Okay. The antiviral stuff would be a little bit more. We'd have to investigate that. And of course, the plasma transfusion would probably not be done here. Okay. Excellent. Um, Dr. Kennedy, tell me what you think about long term impact of this pandemic. Yeah, that's a, that's a tricky question. <laughs> it is. I'm certainly not an economics expert. Um, I, I would guess that this would have some long-term recovery time associated with it. Um, however, looking at past pandemics, the recovery time has been shorter than it was initially thought when it was going on. So I think it's hard to say. I think that for healthcare, um, it's going to kind of push that idea to be more prepared, more ready for a situation. But eventually, the further we get from this, it becomes a business decision as well. You know, these supplies that we're trying to keep in stock, they, they don't come without expiration dates. Um, so you can only stock so many before it's not really feasible to do so as a business anymore. I don't know if you have any other thoughts on long-term effects. <laughs> No, I, I think it's just a range to be seen. I think the faster we get things back up and running, the better off we'll be, obviously. Absolutely. 
Cannot agree more. I um I kind of look at it like we may see a little bit of um I don't want to call it transition entirely, but um, with all of the teledoc appointments and e visits and things like that, you know, I kind of wonder if that's going to play a part long term for any medical practice, even when there's not a pandemic. You know, is that something that you guys think is still going to continue to be offered and maybe even more utilized in the future? I think the telehealth visits will be more utilized after this. Um, there's certainly some specialties that use them highly already. Um, it'll probably be more of a across the board kind of a thing after this. There is still some question marks up about it, especially pertaining to our clinic as a rural health clinic. With our state designation, we have some different rules and regulations that apply. So um, we're looking into it for ourselves, but I think across the board, we're gonna see it utilized more moving forward. That's kind of my thinking. I, I even wonder what the impact will be on education you know, moving forward. I mean, I think there's a lot of possibilities there with, you know, some of us were kind of forced into this, you know, to learn quickly and adapt and figure out how to conduct business in a very different way. Um, but I wonder how much of that will carry over even when we're back to normal, so to speak. I don't know, I guess time will tell, right? <laughs> <laughs> so one of the questions, um, that I've asked the other um, clinics that we've had on. So um, it's just fair, you know, that I ask you all as well. Um, and maybe you can come up with a really great little quippy phrase like, like Dr. Jones did, but no pressure if you can't. But <laughs> it's now a competition. I think that's what I've just done here. Um, but is the, you know, obviously you all know and you're experiencing it as well at the clinic, I'm sure, but there's a great economic impact when we do something like a shelter in, in place. And I know we're all feeling it. There's no, um, there's no business that isn't, um, that doesn't have e a, a trickle down effect, at least, you know, at the minimum, we all feel it. But um, is the, the benefit to healthcare worth that cost to economy? Would you say, what's your opinion on that? You go ahead. <laughs> I'm gonna play some Jeopardy music now. <laughs> I I think that the benefit is worth it. I mean, I think that doing the measures we've done in this country seemed extreme at first, but we're seeing the impact of that now positively. So I think it's worth it. I I do have my own personal fear about seeing more cases once these are lifted because you do have to have some immunity, you know, herd immunity to prevent the spread. So I, I do have some concerns about seeing cases later, but I think that it's been beneficial. And I think that we've seen the numbers coming down. Um, certainly in Texas, I'm not tracking the country, obviously, but in Texas, the, the time that it took our cases to double has been increasingly getting longer and longer. Um, the last time I looked at it, it took about 12 days for our cases to double. So I think we're seeing benefits. Yeah, you know, our, our fear was that we would get hit like New York and that Fort Worth and Abilene and Wichita Falls hospitals would be full and we would be stuck with patients out here that we'd have to manage. We did not have the, enough equipment and personnel to take care of it. And I don't see that happening now. I think that fortunately, you know, we got a, uh, I think that the social, uh, distancing and the uh, early start we got and the, probably the warm weather, I don't think we're gonna see, it's not gonna be like New York. Now, I think New Orleans was impacted. Their climate's you know, similar, but uh, I think Mardi Gras probably had something to do with their uh, being such a hard hit area. But uh, I think as far as our death rate in Texas, it's, you know, compared to other, uh, states like Georgia and Connecticut who have had similar number of cases, uh, our death rate's much lower. And uh, places like Nevada and Arizona are seeing lower death rate. And I think that I'm just still optimistic that the Texas heat's going to be our friend. Well, I like optimism for sure. <laughs> um, and I also like that, um, you know, it makes me proud of our, our state that we that we were prepared and that we did enact some very some very bold measures pretty early on. And now with hindsight, we can look back and say, we're, we're so glad that we did that because we're not suffering like some of these other places. So um, one time, and, and Dr. Brown, you might've been in this meeting, Dr. Kennedy, you may have as well, but 
Dr. Jones said that the best case scenario is that when we have hindsight, we say, oh, I think we may have overreacted a bit. You know, that's actually best case scenario for all of us. And so um, I thought that was a really good point to, to make. And I, it really kind of stuck with me that, you know, being, um, being able to have that viewpoint looking back is actually the best possibility here. So the hospital, you know, we've got extra beds in the hospital. We're all geared up and ready. And if we don't use a single one of them, that's great. That's excellent for sure. We can all celebrate that together for sure. Um, so speaking of the death rate that you mentioned, and, and I warned you that I was going to ask you some of the more pointed questions, Dr. Brown, but I felt like um, you're one of the more um, seasoned medical professionals in Graham and oh, have a lot of rapport. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> well, we talk about wisdom here, okay? <laughs> we talk in wisdom. <laughs> um, so you have, a, you have a lot of rapport with the community, so, um, you know, you're the one that gets these questions, but um, there have been a lot of reports, and, and I don't even know if that's the right word because I don't know that um, where the validation is on some of these, but that the uh, fatality rate has been um, miscalculated and misreported and that we're not getting accurate number of cases and maybe there's some uh, conspiracy or some type of, you know, I don't, I don't know, but, but I know that you know what I'm talking about because you've probably read some of that as well. And uh, anybody who has a Facebook account has probably seen it at some point. So can you address some of that for me? I think that it's very confusing the calculations that are, people are, are doing. I don't think you can pretty, I don't think you can simply look at the deaths and the number of cases and get a percentage. I think that if you look at the fatality rate for the United States, it's like 35%. For the world, it's 20%. For Texas, it's 10%. It's kind of, they're, they're funny numbers. And then if you start adding in the people that have it, a test positive with no symptoms, then that's going to change your equation dramatically. And uh, I think that it's really hard to come up with some good numbers. And that's why all these models they come up with have, have uh, been inaccurate. And the reporting is difficult and the keeping track of people is difficult. And uh, I think these numbers are, are hard to follow. I think that's a good way to put it. And I, I also think maybe it's worth noting that there could sometimes be a difference between false reporting and inaccurate reporting um, because somewhere in there probably lies some intention one way or the other. Um, so, uh, you know, while maybe some of those reports are inaccurate because the numbers are all over the place and difficult to work with and you've got a million factors to calculate in and maybe even some discretion or some decision making there but that doesn't necessarily mean they're false right whereas you know i think a, a false statistic might be one that somebody makes up <laughs> you know um does that make sense or does that would you agree with that i think i think that the, that the statistics are very can be very confusing and uh, I think that uh, the different models have proven to be inaccurate and there's different calculations of the death rate, the fatality rate, and you know, recovered patients versus uh, total cases. It's just, the numbers get very confusing. And I think it's hard to come up with concrete data. For sure. I took a uh, statistics class as part of my MBA in college and, um, you know, I really think the main lesson that we learned in that class, and if my professor sees this, hopefully that's not an insult, but um, the main lesson we learned is that you can use statistics to prove any point you want to make. There you go. Um, and, and he showed us how, and we, uh, you know, some of it was mind blowing because you would think that you found the exact right concrete data. This is the statistic. And he'd say, well, what about if you change this one factor, you know, and one of the examples he gave was about um, the rate of fatality when it came to breast cancer. And so the, the model that we were working with was taking a sampling of women who had gone in for a mammogram and then kind of data from that. Anyway, 
Um, so at the end of it, you know, we're all, we've worked in teams. We're so, you know, positive that we've got this figured out and we know what the, the statistic is. And he says, your statistic was flawed from the beginning. And we were like, what? And he said, how many women go in for a mammogram and how many do not? Right. You already right. have a flawed statistic. And we were like, oh, you know, so um, anyway, all that to, st to say that uh, statistics can usually be worked any which way you want to get the data that you want. But, um, but I also saw something on the internet yesterday that was talking about um, some of the other long-term effects of this virus on the body, not necessarily death, but some of the other lasting effects um, that it could have on the respiratory system and other things. And so what about, um, so, you know, maybe that's even something, a, a greater fear, if you will, or, or something to think about when we're talking about this virus. What do you think? I think it's too easy to know any lasting effects at this point. I think if we're going to go based on experience, there's other coronaviruses out there, and I don't think we have a lot of long-term lasting effects when you get infected with one of those. So I would be optimistic about that. Um, but I think it's too soon to know the long-term effects that this could potentially have at this point. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't even want to speculate about it. Honestly, that makes perfect sense. Absolutely. Um, what about people who are being quarantined right now, um, who have been exposed or have tested positive? Um, what is the protocol? And, and, and we've covered this um, before, but we still get quite a few questions about it. So I'd like to just go over it again, if that's OK. Um, but what is the protocol for notifying people who may have been exposed through that person who tested positive? The, the primary care physician or the testing facility will reach out to patients and notify them, but the state is also notified, and there's a state epidemiologist who then follows cases, and they have their different areas of the state that they're assigned to. So we have a state epidemiologist that covers our area, and so they help track cases and help with retesting and help clear patients, so to speak, after they've been in quarantine for so long. It's going to vary a lot, person to person, how long you're in quarantine. We hear two weeks all the time, but it's, it's two weeks after you're not having fevers and your respiratory symptoms are improving. So um, it's going to vary quite a bit from person to person how long they're, they're in quarantine. But it's, it's a teamwork or a team effort, if you will, between their doctor and the state. I also think um, this is something that Dr. Jones noted, and I just, I want to keep saying it as many times as I possibly can, but um, the patient zero that we had here, uh, Dr. Jones flat out told me that he is, uh, he did all of the right things and in doing so really prevented a lot of potential spread of that virus. And so, um, I think that's something we can also be proud of here in Graham is that we have um, people here who care about each other and who are acting responsibly and doing what they need to do to self quarantine and keep others from getting sick. Um, and I think that's, you know, I, I just want to say that every chance I get every platform I get because um, it makes me proud to live in a town where people behave responsibly and, and take that kind of, um, you know, make that kind of decision and, and protect other people. So Anyway, proud of that as well. Um, Misty, do we have any questions so far? Not a single question. You guys, you guys are so smart that you covered everything. <laughs> well, what else do you all, do you all want to, um, I didn't start off by doing this, um, Dr. Brown and Dr. Kennedy, but do you want to tell anybody a little bit about what you all do or uh, your hours, et cetera, anything like that? Well, I'm working uh, two days a week. I work Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Dr. Kid Kennedy's there four and a half days a week. Uh, and we have a nurse practitioner that's there uh, Monday, Thursday, and Friday when cat fives. So we've got someone there all day, every day, five days a week. And uh, Dr. Kennedy's doing OB, which is a, a big addition to our medical community. And uh, he's anxious to start seeing some more patients for Obsessive. That's excellent. I know we're so excited to have you here, Dr. Kennedy. It's been nice being here. I'm, I'm ready for some of those uh, 
OB patients and some of those babies to start coming in. So excellent, excellent. I love it. Well, and um, Dr. Kennedy, tell, how many children do you have? Is that okay for me to ask on this? <laughs> Are you going to kill me later? <laughs> okay, I have four. I love. I just think that's awesome. Three I girls and a and a boy. You're just, um, you're one of those people I look up to and respect and admire. Somebody who can get through med school for kids. That is like, can't imagine it. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> but we're all, you know, I'm over here complaining about the shelter in place and trying to homeschool two kids, you know, and, and a three-year-old while I'm working full time. And I'm not sure how you did it, but obviously your work ethic supersedes anything I've ever seen before so <laughs> homeschool is a whole different ball game ask all of my kids teachers I've been messaging them constantly <laughs> still impressed more impressed even well um we appreciate both of you so much we're so uh, fortunate to have you both in Graham and thank you for sharing your your knowledge and your wisdom with us today I also want to thank the one and only Pete Clark with Texas Made Security he is handling our streaming for us on the technical side of things and has been absolutely phenomenal and, and actually really a lifesaver for the chamber um, on getting these set up. And our goal is to get information out to the community and to our chamber members. Um, and he has made that possible for us. So I think that he is interested in doing um, a similar service for other businesses. So if you are interested in that, please contact him and he'd be happy to work with you. But um, he's been great for us. Also, Starting next week, uh, when we do these information sharing sessions on Facebook Live, you can also tune in to Y100.5 and catch the information broadcasted through the radio there. So um, we're excited to have them sharing this information as well. And hopefully we can just continue to get, get that out into the community and keep people informed, keep people um, motivated and encouraged, because obviously we know we're going to get through this. We just need to all work together. But. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Brown, Dr. Kennedy, and please let us know if there's anything we can do for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.